Hi everyone and welcome to our first webinar in our Accelerated Acquisition Technologies in MRI series. Today's webinar introduces acceleration techniques. This includes simultaneous multi-slice acquisition, compressed sensing and AI. This webinar will also cover implementation guidance in MR service case studies. Our speaker today is Stephen Jackson, a principal clinical scientist in MRI working at the Christie NHS Foundation Trust. He is supporting the Advanced Acceleration Technology Implementation in the Northwest of England, where the rollout of the new technology started in March 2022. He is also co-chair of the IPIM Task and Finish Group working on this topic. At the end of the webinar, there will be a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, could you please type them into the chat? And finally, this webinar is being recorded. It will be uploaded to YouTube and at a later date, the link will be sent out. Thanks again for joining and I'm going to hand you over to Steve. Thanks very much, Pauline. Um, I'll just get my screen shared and we'll get started. Okay, so um, <clears throat> just make sure everyone can see that screen. Just give me a quick um, nod or a noise. We can see the screen, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, so we're going to talk about um, advanced acceleration technology in MRI today. Um, and we're going to cover a bit of background to these techniques <clears throat> and we're going to discuss the actual underlying science of them in a broad brush strokes for the compressed sensing, simultaneous multi slice, and AI going to look at some example images and some example protocols. In terms of the implementation guidance, we'll look at the installation, the deployment, um, image quality concerns, and some new artifacts you may come across. And we'll end by looking at some service case studies as well. So when we talk about um, acceleration in MRI, um, if we kind of have a bit of a, um, a brainstorm of what potential benefits of seriously accelerated MR sequences might be, then you could begin by thinking about the patients that are having shorter appointments, um, less discomfort while in the scanner, less hesitancy to attend if they know they're gonna have a very short scan. For radiology managers, um, accelerated sequences um, should lead to increased patient throughput, which is obviously a stated national aim. For example, the 2022-23 priorities and operational planning guidance, where um, departments are asked to provide a minimum of 120% of pre-pandemic levels um, in terms of diagnostics. <clears throat> for radiologists, there's a potential for quicker reporting due to better patient compliance and fewer motion artifacts. And for radiographers, um, better patient compliance, lists finishing on time are often less time owing, um, etc. So um, the, this kind of unicorn land of heavily accelerated MR sequences has got potential benefits for um, a, a wide variety of staff groups within radiology. Um, so the term advanced acceleration technology or AAT as we refer to it quite often was introduced recently across the UK and it encompasses a range of MR sequence acceleration techniques that were recently introduced. Um, and the key headline is that MR AAT can significantly accelerate MR image acquisition without the usual penalty and image quality associated with traditional MR acceleration techniques. So that's what we are um, claiming and that's what the manufacturers are claiming. And hopefully by the time we've got to the end of the presentation that you'll believe you'll um, you'll agree that this is um, this is reality in many, many cases. So each implementation is manufacturer specific, but there are broad categories and that's how we'll structure this presentation. Um, and a task and finish group, as mentioned by Pauline, has been set up um, via the IPEM MR special interest group to raise awareness and share knowledge of MRAAT throughout the community. <clears throat> so a little bit on the task and finish group. So um, it was formed um, late last year um, with the group of clinical MR physicists across the UK and Ireland. Um, the aim that we have is to create a set of resources for radiologists, radiology managers and radiographers, ideally by the end of this year. And that will include a website providing up to date and detailed information about AET provision and user experience from three main manufacturers in the UK, uh, including details of kind of software availability on different makes and models and software versions, etc. Um, a series of webinars to share knowledge and experience of AAT implementation from the user perspective, again, across the main manufacturers, of which this is the first of four webinars. Um, the publication of a, of a topical report summarizing the implementation experience we've gained um, and um, bringing together some of the case studies um, that we've uh, been working on over the last few months. 
and provide example protocols um, for other sites to, to use as a reference. So sharing protocols, examples of, of AAT having been deployed successfully at, um, at other centers. So um, there's already a lot of resources out there, a lot of webinars, conferences, et cetera, have dedicated time to this topic. So I feel the need to kind of justify why um, we've invited you all to yet another webinar about MRAAT. And the reason is it's an extremely um, fast moving field. So the BIR event in last November, um, there's been one major technology released since then and one major technology was released around about that time. And there's more developments in the pipeline across all three manufacturers that we're expecting over the next 12 to 18 months or more. Um, so it's a moving picture and um, the goalposts are moving and it's it's going to be quite tricky to keep track of everything that's, that's new and just been released. So um, these webinars are kind of a state of play for where we are right now. And um, if we were to do this exercise again in six months, 12 months time, it would be a slightly different presentation, I'm sure. <clears throat> so as we mentioned, this is the first of a series of four. Um, the other three webinars in this series are um, intended to provide manufacturer specific implementation guidance. So for sites with GE scanners, um, then next Friday um, at the same time is where we will spend um, the best part of an hour discussing um, implementation guidance and advice of the AAT available to GE users. Similarly for Siemens the following Friday and for Philips thereafter. Um, and yeah, so um, be very happy to welcome you to, to as many of those as are relevant for your department. So we're gonna do a bit of background physics now in terms of MR acceleration. So long pulse sequence acquisition times are a known issue in MR. And some acceleration techniques are standard practice and have been around for many years. For example, turbo spin echo, um, partial Fourier or half scan, parallel imaging, etc. But historically, there's always been a trade-off. Reducing imaging time generally leads to a compromise in SNR, spatial resolution, or both, um, certainly for routine imaging. <clears throat> and I'll have a look at some of these traditional acceleration methods just because they're relevant to how uh, to kind of give a broad brushstroke explanation of how the new techniques work. So we know that MR image images are required line by line in case space. Um, the vast majority of them are um, the ones that are relevant to today's presentation. And that information we collect is then Fourier transformed into our final image. The way that partial Fourier or half scan works is it will acquire a subset of case space, for example, five eighths or six eighths, seven eighths. And it'll use um, properties of the mathematical symmetry of case space to um, fill in the rest of case space and then reconstruct with the Fourier transform. So the benefit here is that you can by only um, acquiring a subset of the case space, you acquire your imaging faster. Similarly with parallel imaging, in this um, method, you will skip um, a certain number of lines of case space, for example, every other line, um, which will allow you to speed up significantly. And then you use information about the receive coil um, element sensitivities uh, that you collect along with the scan to use the information you've collected to fill in the rest of case space and to then go ahead and Fourier transform and create your image. So again, it allows you to go quicker, but the trade-off in both these situations is reduced signal to noise ratio. So for the third and final time, the three main techniques that we'll discuss um, throughout these webinars are compressed sensing, simultaneous multi-slice and artificial intelligence. So as with existing parallel imaging and partial Fourier techniques, the names of the specific implementations of these technologies by each vendor is unique. So it's yet more um, terminology to add to the gigantic minefield of, of names um, within the, the kind of the, the MR community. Um, and we'll begin by discussing um, sort of the background compressed sensing and then some example images, protocols, and case studies. So compressed sensing um, techniques in MRI and in other fields, um, but MRI is obviously the one we're interested in today, have three key elements. So an incoherent subsampling of the MR signal in case space, transforming to a sparse imaging domain for denoising, and then an iterative reconstruction that allows you to kind of keep denoising until you've reached a satisfactory level of image quality. So what do we mean by incoherent subsampling? Well, on the um, first column of this image, we have um, an example of a case space where every single pixel, um, which is represented by a red square, is filled. We have a fully sampled image and we have a um, full resolution um, um, high SNR image reconstructed in the, in the bottom row. If we were to only um, collect um, the data at the center of case space, we would have an image with good contrast, but an image that was um, very low in spatial resolution. If we subsample by skipping lines, as we mentioned previously in relation to parallel imaging, 
then we would have um, the actual reconstruction before we go through the parallel imaging algorithm would be um, a kind of a heavily aliased acquisition. So if we subsample in a coherent fashion, i.e. by skipping other, other line, every other line of K space, we'll end up with a, um, an aliased image. If, um, and when we talk about um, incoherent subsampling, so that is, we are now subsampling this K space, but not in any, um, regular pattern like we were doing with the, um, the coherence of sampling. So this example is kind of an image processing one. This isn't how the um, scanner will collect the data for 2D imaging. Um, in this case, all the red pixels have data and all the places where there are no red pixels don't have data. And the result of reconstructing something like that is that you get an image with a good outline of the anatomy you're interested in, but this is this incoherent smear of, of noise-like characteristics that, um, that kind of um, are seen all the way across the image. So the compressed sensing algorithm denoises the image a little more each time, and it does it in this um, sparse representation. And so if k-space wasn't enough for you and you're getting greedy with your abstract mathematical spaces, don't worry, we've now got w space along to fill that gap. And it's in this w space, this sparse representation where we then do our denoising. And for each individual denoising step, we compare it to our original image and if it's consistent enough with the collected data, or if we've gone through the whole iterative process um, more times or as many times as our maximum number of iterations allows in the sequence, then the reconstruction will stop and the final image will be um, will be output. So that's, um, again, broad brushstrokes of how these algorithms work. Each individual manufacturer um, does it slightly differently. And this is where we start talking about the different packages that are available from a manufacturer. So Philips, um, their CS implementation is Compressed Sense, and it's available for the majority of 2D and 3D sequences, including Routine, Turbo Spin Echo, STIR, FFE, etc. And quite recently, with the uh, implementation or with the availability of the Smart Speed package, radial sequences, for example, the Motion Free built on a multi vein, so it's basically sequences that are good at comp um, compensating for patient motion, they can also be accelerated using this Compressed Sense technique too. Um, obviously, the, the sense um, has got a specific meaning in terms of parallel imaging, and it is using this Philips-based, um, or this Philips implementation of the parallel imaging is kind of the bedrock for this technique. In terms of GE, um, the compressed sensing is available for specific 3D applications only. So these are 3D sequences only, um, and the trade names are HyperSense and HyperCube. And for Siemens, um, Again, available for specific 3D applications only, but a little bit wider application than GE potentially, although it's separated into individual sequences. So compressed sense time of flight, for example, compressed sensing time of flight, sorry, compressed sensing CMAC space and grasp vibe. Um, for those of you interested in how much this costs or whether it's available for existing scanners, it's a very complex picture. Uh, in terms of availability, um, this is changing all the time and um, we'll kind of dedicate a slide to that later on. In terms of the cost, it's not something that we're able to comment on. And uh, in all these situations, a manufacturer is, is obviously the best source of information. Um, in terms of the availability of certain compressed sense sequences um, and not others, then the manufacturers are packaging these in various ways that are kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. But it's worth being aware that by having one package with a compressed sense doesn't mean it'll be applicable throughout the entire um, anatomies that you may wish to deploy it. So um, need to keep a careful eye on the packages that are available. So we'll have a look at some example images here. So um, from the three main manufacturers again. So an example of the HyperSense being deployed in MRCP um, in a GE scanner. And the times 2 by 2.2 shows you what the acceleration factor is using this compressed sensing. So it's higher than you can usually go on, the, on a GE scanner, certainly for routine sequences. In the middle, we have a time of flight exam. Uh, we're used to these taking between six and seven minutes for the large field of view we have here. Uh, and this example um, was acquired in under four minutes, and that's thanks to an acceleration factor of six um, in this particular sequence. And finally, for Philips, as we said earlier, Philips is the only one currently where they deploy compressed um, sense in 2D, routine 2D TSC sequences. And this is a good example of kind of a long bone exam uh, with a compressed sense factor of 2.5. So again, a little bit faster than you'd usually want to go with um, with the usual sense parallel imaging. And that takes the scan time down to two minutes and nine seconds. In terms of implementation guidance, um, very broad brushstroke again, switch on the compressed sensing and amend the acceleration factor to a point where you're 
confident that the image quality is sufficient. Um, there'll be a lot more to say about this later on. And again, each one is manufacturer specific. So um, we'll refer you to the, the upcoming webinars for, for more information about how exactly to implement this. So there's some example images for the three main manufacturers covered in this presentation. Um, in terms of an example protocol, is one of the rectum. So the original protocol was um, just over 16 minutes. Um, after the compressed sense was applied, this is a Philips um, 3T system, by the way. Um, after the compressed sense was applied, we are then down at a total protocol length or total sequence length within the protocol of 11 and a half minutes. And we can see a comparable image quality between the original image and the compressed sense equivalent there. Again, more details of the individual specific um, parameter changes um, will be in the Philips webinar on the 30th of June. <clears throat> so in terms of the IPEM task and finish group user experience with these techniques, so we're definitely finding that higher acceleration factors than traditional parallel imaging are possible. Um, and the iterative, iterative reconstruction algorithm gives full resolution high SNR images. And the result of this is accelerated ac acquisition because less sampling is needed up front. <clears throat> Um, it's not all upside, so the motion artifacts, um, as and when they occur, tend to be exaggerated compared to non-compressed sense sequences, and we've got an um, example of this later on. And the reconstruction, because you've got to um, iterate your images through that, through that pathway um, any number of times, um, it does take longer than your traditional um, Fourier transform reconstruction. And the a, a large percentage of this um, webinar is related to using these techniques for acceleration, but there's nothing to stop um, a site or a particular anatomy or a particular scan within a site, um, it's nothing to stop these AAT being used to improve image quality while retaining the same amount of time as the original sequence was um, 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 took, essentially. So overall, across all the manufacturer base, this technique is most beneficial for 3D acquisitions that have sparse data intrinsically. So for example, angiography and MRCP. <clears throat> And it's limited to a small number of 3D sequences for, for some of the main vendors out there. So that summarizes everything that um, we planning to say about compressed sensing today. So we'll move on to simultaneous multi-slice. So SMS techniques, they use specialist RF pulses to excite multiple slices simultaneously. Um, we've got an example in the diagram here of a the applied RF pulse is essentially the sum of two RF pulses that are exciting two different slices of tissue. Um, the RF pulses are, are um, especially adapted such that one of the slices will reconstruct in the familiar um, familiar way, but the other one will reconstruct with a field of view shift, essentially, so that um, the information from the anatomy will be kind of um, moved upwards or downwards, left to right, etc., within the image, so it appears as two different um, isolated areas of signal. And those two appear as your final image as superimposed on each other. And we then need to use um, an unwrapping algorithm similar to parallel imaging to separate those into the two separate slices that can then be written to DICOM and, and, um, and reported on. So again, we'll go through this, the same kind of set of slides. So the manufacturer specific info for SMS, um, it's available for several 2D sequences uh, on the Siemens systems, including EPI, Resolve, and TurboSpin Echo, including the Dixon. Um, GE, uh, it's available for EPI only, but obviously this can be used for diffusion weighted imaging, diffusion tensor imaging, and fMRI. And Philips is a similar story. The multiband sense um, technique is available currently for EPI only um, and the same applications as the GE system. Um, some of these are 3T only, but I've not been confident enough to nail that down for this particular presentation. And again, I'll say very similar things, as I said, in the compressed sensing section, the cost and the avail availability um, will vary for each of these techniques and the return that you will get on your investment in terms of um, image quality and patient throughput will be different for, for different manufacturers as well. So some example images, um, we'll start on the right hand side this time. So the Philips, the multiband sense, um, there's an example of it being used in um, DTI on a local system. Uh, for the Siemens, um, this is a, just a, a hand scan and the TSE has been used here with the hand wrist coil allows us to acquire this um, high quality image with an SMS factor of two in one minute, 22 seconds. On the left-hand side, we have an example of the hyperband being used uh, on a GE system, again, for um, DTI-based application. Um, this one's in a square box um, because this is uh, manufacturer promotional information. Um, it isn't um, 
anything that we've got experience of in the group to date. So implementation guidance for this particular technique. So SMS factors of two or more, um, depending on your receive coil, may allow you to reduce your um, repetition time, reduce your packages or concatenations, and any of those changes you make can be used to speed up the acquisition. So there's some example images for the manufacturers. We'll again have a look at an example protocol optimization using this technology. So here's an original um, SMS, sorry, an original um, non-AAT ankle protocol um, coming in at around about 12 and a half minutes. Um, an AAT version of this protocol using only the SMS TSE technology on the Siemens scanner um, reduced that time by around about five minutes. And we see a comparable image quality again from the two um, from the two techniques. So more details of individual parameter changes again. Um, please join us on the 23rd of June for the for the third of the webinar series. So our user experience with SMS <clears throat> is that higher acceleration factors than traditional parallel imaging is possible. And there's no SNR penalty in theory. And for the most part, where you've got adequate receive call coverage, this is um, what we find in practice as well. The reconstruction does take a little bit longer than non-AAT sequences. And this can cause you to kind of consider rejigging your protocol a little bit. If, um, if you know that certain sequence is going to take a long time to reconstruct, you ideally don't want that to be last in your protocol uh, because then you're just waiting around for quite a lot of time before you can decide whether the last image was any good and whether the patient come off the bed or not. So the long reconstruction times are kind of causing uh, causing kind of departments to, to consider new things that they haven't thought about before. Um, the result for SMS is an accelerated acquisition as two or more slices can be collected at once. Again, this could be used to improve image quality if sequence time was kept the same, but much more often than not, these technologies have been used to accelerate um, imaging. And it's currently limited to a small number of EPI-based sequences for some vendors. With regards to the Siemens implementation in particular, because we're using these um, novel RF pulses that are capable of exciting two slices at once or more, um, we may need to carefully optimize for SAR. Um, it's, it's, all, it's, it's very doable, but you may need to think a little bit more carefully about SAR than you would do ordinarily with an RF pulse that isn't exciting um, two slices at once or more. Um, one um, other thing to say outside EPI in the brain, the SMS algorithm unwrapping success can depend on the geometry of the scan and the received coil. Um, so again, you just need to be very careful that we're testing each one of these implementations um, to make sure that if, um, adequate image quality is, uh, is being provided. <clears throat> so now I'll move on to talking about artificial intelligence. So um, this is a much broader subject than MR. Um, as I'm sure you're aware of lots of different things in the news recently, um, as is compressed sensing, and, um, but they've got a long history. But it's only within the last sort of 18 to 12 months that these kind of technology, well, two, three years or so, that these kind of technologies are becoming commonplace on um, scanners um, in, in you know, your district generals rather than inside your research centers. So there's a lot of associated terminology here, deep learning, neural networks, et cetera. And each implementation that the manufacturers have done <clears throat> will fit best into a certain category of AI, but we think it's safe at the kind of level of overview we're looking at in this particular webinar just to refer to all of these under the AI umbrella, <clears throat> even though some of them aren't necessarily strictly AI um, by definition. Hope you'll forgive that um, generalization. So <clears throat> in terms of the MR implementation, it's an extra image processing step that seeks to improve image quality. Many applications boost SNR, and this allows quicker images to be acquired. Um, in a, and again, we'll have a look at that in a couple of slides time. And each implementation, again, is manufacturer specific. So there's a lot of um, manufacturer specific stuff to learn when you start looking into these things. And some applications also increase image sharpness, and this allows matrix sizes to be reduced for the same image quality. And that's got other benefits in terms of boosting your SNR and reducing your time, et cetera. And yet more applications are kind of designed or intrinsically reduced characteristic MR artifacts as well. So there's a lot of kind of side benefits coming along with the, the AI kind of reconstructions for improved image quality. Now, again, as a very broad brushstroke in terms of how this is working, um, this is information taken from um, the Canon website. So I'm very grateful to um, Canon for um, putting this information online that we can use because it's unfortunately it's the only place in the webinar where we've managed to have space for them 
just because there's not many of the Canon scanners in the regions that we are currently working in. So the the very broad way of looking at this technology is you have some low SNR images and some high SNR images of the same anatomy. Um, and they undergo what's known as a training phase for the deep learning algorithm. And this is carried out by the manufacturers. You feed both of the low SNR and high SNR images into a deep learning algorithm <clears throat> uh, or a neural network. And that neural network is trained to take as input the low SNR image and provide as output the high SNR image. And whatever parameters are kind of set in that um, convolutional neural network are then brought forward as a clinical product. <clears throat> so in clinical use, you would then go ahead and only acquire the low SNR version. That image would then be fed into this neural network and that neural network would then do what it's been trained to do and increase the SNR of that image. And it's this this kind of this step in the blue box that is the, the product that's basically used um, that's, that's um, available for all these different manufacturers. So again, there's a lot of subtleties about the ways that different manufacturers do this. So this is just um, this is just as a as a very broad introduction to how this how this works. So in terms of clinical practice, so if we have a look at an original non AAT image such as this one, if we were to degrade that in some way. Um, to kind of reduce the SNR or reduce the um, resolution, for example, by employing a higher parallel imaging factor, by reducing the number of averages, by employing a higher bandwidth, by decreasing the matrix size, etc. Well, then, in theory, we can use AI to recover all the image quality we lost in degrading the image. And the clinical project, the, the kind of the way this can be deployed in the clinic would be to acquire an image like this clinically and use the AI to reconstruct the full resolution higher scenario image that we wanted in the first place. Now, I must stress that this slide is quite an exaggeration of the process. Um, the image in the middle um, is um, obviously very low quality for purposes of this demonstration. But that is essentially how these algorithms can be used to, um, to reduce time and to um, maintain, or in some cases, improve image quality with that reduced time. So, um, the neural networks, they are trained on real image data by the manufacturers. Um, and the training phase uses tens of thousands of images or subsets of images or subsets of transforms of images. Again, there's lots of different ways the manufacturers um, can do this. Uh, an important thing to note is that the clinical deployment is completely fixed. So the software is not learning in real time. So it's, it's by the time the parameters of this combinational neural network or however else it's done have been set, that is the product. There's no kind of likelihood of this getting exponentially better in time as it meets more and more images out in the clinic. It is one fixed product that you can deploy um, today, tomorrow, and in five years' time. Um, uh, one other thing to keenly stress as well is that the available software that's already um, on scanners in, in the country and in the world has been extensively tested by the manufacturers and validated for its FDA and CE approval, etc. So there's always a a kind of a, a fear of the unknown here or a worry that there's potential to be um, new things added into the image that were you know artifactual or not real etc and these are completely understandable concerns but um, I think that it's it's very reassuring that the software has been tested very very extensively before it's been able to be marketed by the manufacturers so we'll move on to the manufacturer specific info. So for Siemens, we have the deep resolve package available for 2D TSE sequences. Um, this comprises a few different um, um, technologies. So deep resolve gain um, is, was kind of the first generation of their AI technology. And this is an intelligent denoising software um, that only fits very loosely into the AI category actually. Um, but it's an intelligent way of denoising images that have been acquired. Deep resolve boost, um, takes the original case base information and transforms that into your final image via a, a, a very powerful deep learning algorithm. And this deep resolve sharp is the technology that can take low resolution images and um, up sample them into high resolution images, um, again, using, using artificial intelligence. The deep resolve swift brain um, is kind of a one-stop shop for acquiring lots of different contrasts within one scan, um, but that's currently available for 3T only. And again, it's not something the, the, um, the group currently has any experience of. Um, GE have their Air Recon DL um, AI technology, and it's available for a wide range of 2D sequences. Um, has proven proven extremely useful, as we'll see in, in slides to come. 
Philips have their CSAI available for, uh, and again, a very wide range of 2D and 3D applications. And it's built on the compressed sense algorithm we introduced a little bit earlier on. And the AI part that Philips have introduced is kind of embedded in one of the sections of their compressed sense algorithm. So that's, um, so that's what's available currently. And again, um, how available these are for your software version, your hardware, et cetera, will, will be um, quite, a, quite a difficult story to unpick in a lot of cases. So some example images again. So we have air recon DL on the left, um, a lumbar spine in under a minute and a half. Uh, in the middle, we have a, a wrist scan with a deep resolved boost technology in under a minute. Um, we have the CSAI. Um, this was an original scan of four and a half minutes and been reduced to three minutes by the CSAI technology. So it's all very impressive time savings and very, um, very good image quality with these algorithms. Again, some protocol based examples. So here's an example of um, a pituitary protocol. So the original was um, 26 minutes 42. This is a, a local center in Greater Manchester. Following AAT um, implementation, that was down to under 10 minutes, or just under 10 minutes. And actually, in some cases, the image quality was actually um, improved by, by going through this process. So <clears throat> there's, there's all kinds of things that can feed into such a spectacular time saving. It could be that the original sequences could have been optimized a little bit before the process happened. Um, and they potentially weren't as, as quick as they could have been. They may have been optimized for something other than speed earlier in the process. Obviously, with pituitary, you've got usually quite thin slices. But nevertheless, the time saving there is, is, um, is very impressive. <clears throat> and for the last time, again, more details of the individual sequence parameter changes that were made to get from one to the other here are available in the um, manufacturer-specific webinar. So please join us next Friday for, for GE users if, if you're able to. And one more example would be um, the deep resolve package on a clinical knee scan. So the original, this is on a Siemens solar system. <clears throat> um, so under 10 minutes imaging time, and this is including simultaneous multi-slice already in use in this particular, um, this particular example. By the time deep resolve had been implemented and the sequences have been optimized and reviewed, um, the site has implemented a AAT protocol as under five minutes. And again, the image quality, the sharpness we're able to get and the signal we're able to get is comparable to the original sequences, if not slightly improved in certain circumstances. <clears throat> so just to summarize our user experience here. So AI um, can deliver remarkable image quality from fast, um, what are on paper, um, low SNR acquisitions. And it does appear to be robust enough to allow a wide range of protocols to be significantly accelerated across um, all vendors. Reconstruction times can vary between manufacturers. They're usually longer than non-AAT non -AAT sequences, though not always. There's an honorable mention here for the Air Recon DL, which appears to reconstruct pretty much as quickly as the normal Cartesian non-AAT um, um, sequences. And for the final time, again, it could be used to improve image quality if sequence time is kept the same, if you were wanting to go down that route. Um, the potential for unique artifacts has been put in a bit of a question mark there. There's definitely some artifacts that do arise if you try and push this technology too far. Um, and we'll sh show an example of that um, a little bit later on. Um, how unique they are is, is still an area that we're kind of um, up for debate. And as, as with previous examples, each manufacturer implementation has its subtleties and has its own sort of set of terminology and, and names to get used to. So please see the future webinars for, for more information. Okay, so I've done a very thorough introduction of the three technologies and hopefully covered uh, a, a good wide span of what's available on each of the individual manufacturers that we're able to cover in this webinar. I'll now talk more generally about kind of implementation guidance for um, sites out there who have who are getting the technology soon, don't know if they can get the technology, um, are looking at how best to implement, etc. So firstly, for um, Existing scanners installation, so it may be possible already to purchase licenses for AAT on your existing scanner and software version, but you may require scanner software and our system hardware grade. And for the oldest generation of scanners up there, it's probably um, not going to be possible full stop. Um, there's a live resource from the IPEM Task and Finish group is attended to assist in assessing options kind of across the manufacturers. And I will um, kind of preview that a bit more in, in the future slide. Um, certain licenses and sequences may not be available for your scanner yet, uh, as in there's nothing on the market currently for your particular scanner, but give it 12 months and the picture will have changed. So it is worth kind of keeping in touch with the manufacturers just to see what is coming down the pipeline 
for your particular scanner, your particular system. And we found that um, if you are needing to pay money up front for these um, technologies, then the cost and the payback time can vary significantly between the, between the AAT techniques. And for some of the AAT implementations we've been involved in, the payback time and increased patient throughput can be on the order of, of a handful of months, which is obviously very encouraging for, for services in general. For any upcoming installations, you can absolutely expect that AAT will be part of the discussion. And just, it's very simple stuff. We just advise that um, AAT, will advise you to look at the full range of AAT available from each manufacturer and how much of it your service would make use of. So there's no point buying a, um, um, a 3D, uh, there's no point buying, for example, a, a, an SMS license that's available in 3T brains only if it's not something that your site will do on a regular basis. <clears throat> Um, one note of caution for trust with managed equipment services, it's unlikely that AI would be considered as a like for like, but obviously that'll be an individual discussion between sites and their MESs. And again, for some AAT payback time and increased patient throughput is on the order of months. So if, if you need some sort of justification or business case to find the extra um, five figures to add these licenses to your new installation, um, I'm pretty confident in saying you, it will definitely be worth your while doing so. Um, in terms of deployment, so obviously as soon as the um, system is installed or if you upgraded, then you have the manufacturer applications training. Um, we found it's not realistic to implement AAT across all protocols in the time available to applications. Um, but the knowledge and experience of these very, very new techniques is building very rapidly um, for, for everybody. The ideal scenario would be to assess an original non-AAT sequence and AAT images in a range of patients with a range of pathologies in each anatomy. Um, unfortunately, for the vast majority of us, that's just, there's time is not available to do that in such a thorough way, um, even though it will be um, the best case scenario to do so. So one thing that we've been using in our region is dedicated volunteer imaging sessions where um, a list is closed for a number of hours and volunteers are scanned um, with the non-AAT and AAT images back to back, and then a radiologist is involved in comparing them and deciding whether um, they are happy to implement the AAT as, as kind of a trial in some upcoming patients. Um, this is something that the MR physics department at the Christie has run in a number of centers in the Northwest. Um, <clears throat> and we found the feedback from radiographers and radiologists has been that having the physics there to, to lead this service and to lead this development has been very, very useful for them, especially as we've been able to share experiences from lots of different trusts in the region. Um, and in these volunteer imaging sessions, we want to deploy the technology as widely as possible for maximum patient benefit. So we ended up listing the top 10 most referred um, examinations at each trust and working out how best we can deploy the available, deploy the available AAT on each of those protocols to have like the biggest impact on patient throughput as early in the process as we possibly could. <clears throat> um, in terms of image quality, so the ability to accelerate is affected by received coil geometry and the intrinsic level of signal in the original in your original sequence. So we can't guarantee, it's not possible to guarantee good image quality for an arbitrarily high acceleration, as you'd expect. There's limits to each AAT's ability to recover SNR. And so uh, a, a very key warning is that each deployment of AAT should be tested to ensure it will give you acceptable image quality. And novel artifacts may be encountered if you don't go through this process or if you do go through this process and you find them and you need to um, make some parameter changes to mitigate them. And motion artifacts in non-radial sequences may be worse than non-AAT equivalent sequences, um, although we do now know there are some AAT um, radial sequences available to reduce the impact of motion artifacts. Um, I've come for a scene next slide there. It's actually the next but one slide. So we mentioned earlier about the um, aims of the MRAT task and finish group. And one of our aims is to provide a website with up-to-date and detailed information about AAT provision and user experience from the three main manufacturers, which includes what model and software info the technology is available for, where it works well, the challenges we've encountered in deploying it across a wide range of anatomies and some general notes. And um, we're very hopeful this website will be um, available and promoted before the end of this webinar series. So. Um, um, yeah, hopefully you'll see an advert for that in the near future and find it useful. Um, so a brief word about artifacts. Any any new technique about uh, in MRI will almost certainly come with its um, own suite of characteristic artifacts. 
and we've got a couple to de demonstrate here. So if we've got a, a TSE, um, uh, sorry, an SMS TSE artifact, if you're pushing the um, SMS factor a little bit too high, you may end up encountering these kind of bright fringe artifacts here. Um, for Philips, this was a patient, uh, this is actually a volunteer who was mimicking the very strong movements of a coughing patient. We end up seeing this really characteristic and novel like um, parallel line artifact from the compressed sense reconstruction. And finally, for the Siemens Deep Resolve Boost, the artifact, uh, Deep Resolve Boost technology, you can see an artifact at the very top here, which is kind of a, a, a relic of an issue in the sense reconstruction part of their Deep Resolve Boost algorithm. And again, if you encounter that during testing, you need to um, ease off the acceleration factors is probably the easiest, easiest way to, um, to, to remove or to start to impact that artifact. So again, just to reiterate, each deployment of AAT should be tested to ensure it will give you acceptable image quality wherever possible. So now I have a brief look at some case studies again from the Northwest, and then we'll, we'll wrap up and um, start the Q&A. So this is a 1.5 Tesla, uh, a trust with a one 1.5 Tesla GE scanner in it with a full range of AAT software options available. And over the course of eight, I think these were four hour volunteer imaging sessions, um, we were able to reduce the protocol timings, as you can see on the right hand side here, although apologies if that's a little bit small to see. Um, some comments from end users as this um, process had been ongoing. So radiologists had noted they'd, they'd noticed improved image quality in brain imaging. The new sequences are easier to report from. And a reporting radiographer said new sequences are better in all cases than those we previously used, which was prior to AAT. So again, very encouraging endorsement of this um, AI technology in the GE system. The Siemens, um, this is a trust with three 1.5 Tesla Siemens in it, again, with a full range of AAT available. Again, seven a number of volunteer imaging sessions, some of these full day, some of these half day. And what we have on the right hand side is a plot of their activity across all three systems and the amount of scans that are outsourcing. This is month by month, how many scans across a three year period. Um, the key thing about this plot, I'm not going to go into it in detail, but the key thing is the purple line. And this is the amount of scans that have been outsourced by this institution. So you can see it was a fairly consistent number of outsourcing up until January 2022, when the two scanners up, um, were replaced. So old um, Ares and Avanto was replaced with Solars. Once the new scanners got back online, the amount of outsourcing dropped down to effectively zero, and it stayed there from um, last autumn onwards, basically. So it's very encouraging for um, radiology manager colleagues out there. So lead radiographer had the following um, thoughts um, and has presented about this separately at UKIO and other places as well. And this is a reporting radiographer as well. Um, so improved patient experience, so fewer repeats for motion artifact, less abandoned scans for claustrophobia. An improved operator experience, so lists are more manageable for staff, there's less time owing accrued and there's an increased pace in the control room. Um, something you'll hear probably more than once with regards to the AI deployments is that MI is essentially ending up a little bit more like CT for better or for worse. And finally, um, a, a hospital with one Philips 3T in it with a compressed sense license, um, no SMS, no AI, four six hour volunteers imaging sessions. And the upshot of this was after implementing the new, the new protocols and reducing imaging slots, we we're able to scan in an additional two patients per day. Um, over a, a period of three months, comparing the first quarter of 2022 with the first quarter of 2023. And that um, sums, that kind of um, calculates as an 11.8% increase in throughput across the defined period. So again, some comments from the lead radiographer at this institution. So we're short on the waiting list for brains and knees. And a, a specific example, so breast patients often find lying prone um, for a prolonged time very difficult and uncomfortable compressed sense has significantly reduced acquisition time, which has improved the patient experience um, for, for that cohort of patients, especially the ones who need to return every year for screening. <clears throat> so last plug for the webinars um, that follow this one. So they are manufacturer specific and they give you details of individual manufacturers implementation of AAT aimed specifically at radiographers and radiologists. Um, information and user experience of deploying specific AAT from each manufacturer will be included, although some of this technology is extremely new, the amount of user experience does vary. And we'll look at example protocol amendments and some further case studies, example images, etc. So please join us if you can for those. And I'd like to sum up by revisiting one of the earlier slides that we looked at. So we discussed the potential benefits, benefits of MRAAT. I think we're just about in a position now where we're able to kind of 
remove the potential and start discussing known benefits of MRAAT, certainly across the institutions that have now had this technology for um, 12 months or, or so. We say that the known benefits of using this technology to accelerate MR sequences uh, for patients, we've got shorter appointments, less discomfort and hesitancy, and fewer movement artifacts. Um, for radiology managers, we've got increased patient throughput. We've also got less outsourcing and shorter waiting lists. For radiologists, we have, um, in principle, quicker reporting due to better patient compliance and fewer artifacts, with the caveat that there's a slightly bigger pile of scans waiting to be reported. Um, and for radiographers, much better patient compliance, less time owing, and lists are finishing on time. In fact, it allows you to rejig, um, potentially allow you to rejig how your department functions in terms of shifts, et cetera, et cetera, if you uh, have got a, a large number of scanners with the AAT deployed to its full extent in your department. So to summarize the, the webinar today, so AAT has amazing potential, which has been realized across the world. The availability is dependent on scanner, make, model, software, and hardware, and it's quite a checker picture at the moment, and it's fast moving, so it's not always easy to keep track of. Um, the IPEM Task and Finish Group um, intends to provide resources to help keep track of this moving picture <clears throat> and to share our experience of implementing the technology from the, from the user perspective. And um, just as a warning, a lot of work is required to deploy AAT across a whole protocol base. Um, radiologist clinical imaging assessment is definitely recommended when you're carrying out this work as well. Um, the investment in technology and scanner time for volunteer imaging we found for many of these techniques will quickly be repaid in clinical time savings um, if, if the sessions are carefully planned um, in advance and run efficiently. And it's here that MR physics input has proven beneficial um, in some centers. So please, for sites um, where you know this is on the horizon, please make sure your MR physics team is involved. They'll be very happy to help. Um, if, if they have the availability, I'm sure. Um, so that's everything I wanted to cover today. So thank you very much, everybody, for um, for joining us today. And I'd like to thank um, this huge list of colleagues um, by by name on paper. I um, don't really have time to read them all out. But in addition to the people individually named, I'd also like to thank all of our radiographer and radiologist colleagues across the Northwest who have worked with the Christie MR Physics Group on implementing this AAT technology. So um, I'll now pass you back to Pauline, and I'm happy to take any questions um, or any discussion points from, from the audience. I'll just stop sharing. Um, thanks, Steve. That was a really nice um, overview as well of um, the different technologies. So I've got a few questions here. So um, would you like to start with compressed sensing, and then we can move on to different topics? So our first compressed sensing question is from Cormac. Um, regarding reconstruction and compressed sensing, if you say you use a factor of three, how much longer does it take? How much longer does the reconstruction take? Yes, that's what it seems to be. Comrade, feel free to correct me. If that's yeah. right. <laughs> um, it's it's not a linear picture, um, is to my um, to my in my experience. So, it isn't if you kind of take a very large two D sequence and it's got a sense factor of two, you change it to compressed sense factor of two, that will take longer than your sense reconstruction. If you up it to a compressed sense factor of three, then that isn't gonna take one and a half times longer than your reconstruction for the compressed sense factor of two. Um, but the individual denoising steps, which we've got no knowledge of or no, no visibility on, will obviously be different when you start with an image that's got more of that incoherent smear um, in and around the, um, the kind of the final image that you're looking for. So um, yeah, not linear is about as much as I'm willing to to um, to uh, a ballpark time frame. Yeah, of course. So it's it's usually under a minute, um, almost always under a minute. If you've got a huge number of slices, then it can it can start to creep just over a minute. Um, and again, it depends on the hardware version you've got. But we're talking um, yeah, certainly in around the thirty second. Or, or less, depending on how many slices you've got. But I would say under a minute is fairly safe for the vast majority of cases. Okay, um, we've got a more of a technical question for compressed sensing. Um, this is from James. So how is case space under sample, um, or case space to give incoherent under sampling and reducing um, acquisition time? It makes sense that it's quicker to under sample case space by missing full lines, but to miss individual pixels in case space, do you not still have to acquire every line and then miss parts of each line. 
Yeah, I, I tried to um, make this as clear as I could in the webinar. I've had this question. I've seen similar slides used elsewhere, and I've, I've had this question myself multiple times. Um, <clears throat> it is, to the best of my knowledge, on all manufacturers, it is simply an incoherent skipping of lines. But the diagram that was used is just, an, it can be thought of in two ways. One, it's just an example of what would happen if you were to just acquire point wires in case space, which obviously scanners don't do. Or you could look at it a different way. You could look at it as the location of the slices going through the plane in a 3D acquisition, for example. So you can look at those kind of pixels that were dotted around incoherently as being the, the end point of a line of case space as it goes through a 3D case space matrix. But in terms of that um, image with the, the, the dots strewn randomly around case space, that does not represent how the actual scanners are requiring the sequences. Jeez, that's, I was trying to figure that one out too. Um, it, yeah, it's it's it, my third time at it. It was where it all clicked. So yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> revision myself. Okay, and we've got another couple of AI ones, and this is coming from Joe, and he asks, uh, "Do we know if they included symptomatic patients in their training data?" Um, personally, I don't know that. I think um, for some of the AI techniques, it's based on um, subsets of images. Whether that is related to um, um, volunteers in the factory or even um, subsets of imaging data that already existed. The short answer is I, I don't know full information on that and I'll kind of refer you to the manufacturers, the clinical scientists, the manufacturers for that for that one. Um, and we have another um, AI question from Cormac. Regarding AI-based techniques, would you recommend ensuring that your acquisitions are optimized before the application of deep learning? As is rightly saying, uh, once you go down the AI route, it'd be very difficult to go back. The, yeah, it's a good question. And there's a, there's a couple of ways you can approach it. Um, I think on every system that we've had involvement with to date, we've always retained the old protocols anyway, whether that's a separate strategy, a separate protocol on the GEs, et cetera. Um, as part of the acquisition, um, I mean, there's, it's, it's always going to be quite um, messy data, especially when it comes to working out time savings, and certainly when it comes to an entire service level, how how many more patients you're getting through, it's extremely messy data to work with. But when it comes to um, the, I've gone and lost my train of thought there. Can you repeat the question for me, please, Pauline? Yeah, this sure. happens too often. Um, I don't <laughs> um, would, re would you recommend ensuring that your acquisitions are optimized before the application of deep learning? It, it depends what, what you're hoping to achieve. So if you're hoping to, um, end up with the most truly representative stats of what AI can do versus the best possible sequence you could have before AAT versus how much of a boost AI, AI AT can give you in terms of your time savings then potentially. But as I mean, the other thing we're doing is seeing it as an opportunity to look at sequences that have been standard for five, six years and optimize them as we are implementing the AAT. So that's kind of probably the most useful way of looking at it. Um, whether you would then make the changes to the original sequences that you're going to save, as well as the AT sequences, I guess that can be up to you as and when you end up deploying the technology. Okay, we have an SMS question from Jonathan. How does SAR concerns change with SMS acceleration? Do we expect different hotspots due to the change B1 distribution? How does this affect accessibility of our implants, especially unlabored ones normally considered okay to scan, for example, like a bone fixation? Yeah, again, it's a good question. Um, I'm not aware of any um, specific kind of modeling of, of the SMS RF pulses related to implants. Um, that it's not something I've ever looked for. Um, it's not a question I've ever asked myself or know of um, in the literature. If anyone on the call has got any um, information or any references for the literature, if you could post them in the chat, that'd be fantastic. But no, there's no additional information you get from the manufacturers to my knowledge about um, how this will differ from a standard single slice excitation RF pulse. Um, so all again, usually all we've got to go on is still just our normal mode first level SAR and make any optimizations to kind of keep our SAR levels below a certain level, whether that's normal mode or whether that is kind of slightly lower for a neurostimulator, et cetera. Okay, thanks. Um, now we have a couple of implementation questions. Um, this is from David. How combinable are the different AAT techniques? For example, with the Siemens TC, can you turn on both SMS and deep resolve boost for even more time saving? 
It's a good question. It, it can get a little silly. Um, and again, I've mentioned there's quite a checkered um, pattern of availability for different scanners, software, hardware, etc. But it's also a bit of um, uh, it's a similar story when it comes to how these techniques can be combined. So the the main one that can be combined, or the only one that we know of that's routinely done, is actually the one you've mentioned. So with the deep resolve boost and deep resolve boost only among the AI techniques, you can also implement SMS. And <clears throat> I've seen this done in an app session, and we ended up getting a very diagnostic T1 shoulder exam in 19 seconds. Um, nobody had the guts to deploy that clinically because it just seemed a bit ridiculous, frankly. I think it was a grappa factor of three or four, and it was an SMS factor of two and it was perfectly diagnostic images, um, but it just was quite, quite a strong one to stomach given that it was acquired in 19 seconds. I've also seen it in, uh, I think in a hand as well, again, on 20, 22, 23 seconds with your SMS applied alongside Deep Resolve Boost. <clears throat> I, think, I think the utility of that particular combination of techniques, <clears throat> there will be certain anatomies where the SMS be really beneficial, but it may be just for patients who you can only really think you might only get two, three minutes out of who are, <clears throat> who are particularly uncomfortable or I'd be brave enough to just deploy this kind of routinely clinically, but it is possible. That sounds, um, 19 seconds is something I'd really like to have in the clinic for, for children anyway. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. I love that. Another question, um, again, with implementation coming from Owen, how many people have managed, um, sorry, how have people managed having variable booking slot lens for different exams for different MR systems? For example, on a fleet of MR systems, where some has AET and some don't. Um, not easily is the short answer to that question. Yeah, it requires a lot of communication with the booking team, um, updates the CRIS, and as soon as you're kind of dealing with trusts that cover more than one hospital, it can get quite difficult. Um, there's there's alternative ways that. Um, it can benefit you um, over the short term without reducing the slot lengths. You could, for example, keep your slot lengths as they are, but you are able then to fit in a lot more inpatients throughout the day because the amount of kind of um, time within the protocol slots where you're actually scanning a patient, the patient is on the table is reduced, and that allows you more time to get more inpatients down if you're in a if you're in a kind of district general, a lot of inpatient um, waiting lists. Um, but it, it is doable. It requires you to kind of build connections with a lot of a lot of people on the kind of the bookings and administration side of things. Okay, we've got um, three minutes left, but the, the, there's two people who've asked a very similar question. Um, so this is from um, John Tracy. Um, how do the AI algorithms handle regular MRI artifacts like metal, for example? Um, it's pretty similar um, in our experience to the, um, the, the original um, non-AI techniques. So, Again, because they're often trained on subsets of data and in terms of how they how the images go through the convolutional neural network, it isn't a full image that goes through the convolutional neural network, it'll be um, subsets of pixels. Again, there's a lot of manufacturer specific subtleties in that. Um, then the intrinsic information you get in case space that you collect from um, you know, a patient with a metal artifact will still be what it is. And then that the algorithms will work on them kind of blind to what that information is is, is containing essentially. So that feels like quite a waffly answer, but in general, it's it's not had a huge amount of um, of impact, or it doesn't look radically different. So <clears throat> another way to answer that question is the void artifacts you'd expect, or the signal pileup artifacts you expect if you've got a, a weekly ferromagnetic implant. They are no different with an AI reconstruction than they are with a um, with a non with a non AAT acquisition. Okay, I think we got one more question to squeeze in before our time's up in under a minute. And this is coming from Robin. Do you have a reference for case study number two? I can't see how this can stop outsourcing given there'd be more images to interpret unless outsource capacity for image acquisition is what is being described. Um, in terms of a reference um, being published, uh, then no. Um, we don't have that. Um, big, uh, the data is kind of still being collected. I'd um, be very happy to put you in touch with um, the site, uh, which is actually quite local to you, Robin. <laughs> um, um, I can put you in touch with the lead radiographer there for information. You're right, there's the, the black curve at the top of that plot was the total number of exams have completely increased. Um, but the AT, um, the, the, the story, and as I say, every data is messy. The story with this trust as well is that there was a cleaning slot for COVID that was... Um, was reduced as part of that data collection. 
So um, the the slots went down significantly thanks to AET, but also thanks to a COVID reduction that will be kind of factored into the final numerical analysis of this site. Um, so much more scans have been acquired, but they were all able to get on those three scanners um, at the time um, in the trust. And yeah, it means there's more reporting needs done, but that is just one of the consequences of this AAT. And what I often say in this situation is, please don't shoot the messenger. Um, it's the, the NHS kind of operational guidance. We need to get uh, more patients through as best we can. And AAT is proving really, really beneficial for that. Okay, I'm afraid that's time up. Thank you everyone for your attendance and your questions today. Um, I know I think there's a lot more um, conversations and discussions, but I feel like this is going to be ongoing and I'm sure we'll have another webinar maybe in the future again um, to discuss further these points. So thanks again. Remember that there will be a recording sent out to everybody. Um, thanks again and take care. Thanks, Pauline. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.